Fall is such an important time here at Timberlake. It is jam-packed with events and things going on for your whole family. One of the most important things we do every fall is our fall groups. We have over 100 different groups meeting in homes, coffee shops, and right here at the church. We decided to reimagine how we could organize groups to make it easier for you to get plugged in. We have men's, women's, classes and studies, marriage and parenting, sports and gaming, meetups, outreach, support, interest, and life stage. We would love for you to find a group and get plugged in. This is a great way to meet a new friend, have fun, and grow in your faith. Groups launched the last week of September. I promise you this will be one of the most important things you can do this fall. So check it out today. Good morning, Timberlake. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Lance. I'm one of the pastors here. I think you picked a great Sunday to be here, especially as we see the hustle and bustle of scurry of of kids heading back to school. Isn't that been fun to see? Maybe you have a student, maybe you are a student and you're heading back to school. I know our kids are heading back to school and it's a sweet, sweet season. And I want you to do me a favor. I want you to, in your mind, go back with me to your ninth grade year as you were heading into high school on the verge and precipice of so many exciting opportunities that life could change as you walked into this new form of education and season of life. As I look back on the year between eighth grade and ninth grade as I headed into high school, I remember thinking to myself, I need to make a change. I need to be the coolest kid in school. I need to do something that's gonna shake things up, that's gonna really stir the crowd a little bit. I need to come in with a renewed sense of confidence. And the clearest way for me to do that at the time as a young guy in North Idaho was to bleach the tips of my hair blonde. Like, that was it. That was the move. One big cheer for bleach tips. Come on. And uh, I remember that was the move. That's gonna set me apart. I mean, I just was thinking to myself, I'm gonna walk down the hall girls will swoon left and right. I mean, it will just be awesome. Everyone will think, who's this new guy that has emerged as the leader of the school? And, and, and so I had a lot of dreams and ambitions. I remember coming to my mom and saying, mom, I don't, I don't really know how to do this. I don't know how to facilitate this or where to find a hairdresser, but maybe you could help me. And uh, I would love to bleach the tips of my hair. And my mom said, fear not, fear not. I can actually do it for you. I will take care of it for you. And yeah, you already know where this is going, huh? And uh, I don't even need to tell the story. I, uh, I remember thinking, great, I am a loving, trusting, and obedient son. I place my hopes and dreams in your hands, mom. And uh, she comes home with a box of blonde hair dye, and I get so excited. I'm dreaming about what's to come. I adorn a towel over my shoulders, and she begins to massage the hair dye into my hair. And two things are running through my head. One, unbridled enthusiasm, just for what's to come. And then two, I was curious. I was curious because I didn't know a lot about hair care technology, but I thought, what radical advances that they have that you could put it in my hair and the dye differentiates the root from the tip. Like, that's unbelievable. And I I didn't know any better, but I'm thinking, this is really what day and age we're living in. And this is really a beautiful time in human history. And so uh, I get done, and I go to wash out my hair. I'm so excited. I wash it all out. I take a shower. I round the corner out of the bathroom, and the first person I see is the most honest person in my life, my older brother. And and he starts dying laughing, just... (laughs) undone. I have never seen him laugh so hard. Not the response I was hoping for. And so immediately a sinking feeling starts to set in to my heart. I also make eye contact with my mom who has this mixed feeling of unfailing love who will always and unconditionally love me and a little bit of concern. And I run back into the bathroom only to be greeted with traffic cone orange hair. Root to tip, whole thing orange hair. My heart dropped. Dreams and ambitions of the influence I would have evaporate. They're all gone. And a lot like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, I avoided cameras for that season of my life, except for one faithful shot. And I figured, what a better place to share it than in front of a couple thousand people. And so uh, I wonder if you can pick me out of this shot right here. Yeah, I don't, wasn't good at hiding. I did wear a Canada shirt, hoping that people was just, I'm a foreigner and I didn't know any different. I would just blend in. All my friends would be like, that can't be. He's wearing a Canada shirt. No, we can get rid of it. That'd be great. Yeah. 
we all have regrets, and I'm, con- I'm continuing the series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And as we look over the course of our life, what I know is universal for the people in this room and anyone watching online, as we all have, well, regrets. We all have things that we wish would have gone differently, ways we wish things would have played out, decisions we wish we would have made or not have made. And these are big things and little things. I mean, we have regrets over things that we procrastinate, We have regrets over the things that we say quickly. We have regrets over staying up a little too late and watching that one extra show because you pay the price in the morning. You have regrets over that time you saw the thing in the back of the fridge and you smelled it and you thought, yeah, it's probably gonna be fine. And it wasn't. And you regret your choice. And there's little things, but there's also, I mean, come on, there's huge things in our life. As you look back, you may regret the way that you raised your kids. You may regret the way that you handled a relationship. You may regret a job opportunity that you took or didn't take. You may regret what you said when you were mad and you can't take back. You may regret the damage that has been done through an email or a text message that you sent and you thought you were in the right and you knew it and you stewed over it and crafted it and it did its job and it just sunk the knife deep and now you look back and you can't take it back. We all have regrets. We all have things that we wish would have been different. There's a lot of different definitions for regret, but the one that I wanna go with today is simply this. Regret is how we fill the gap between what we did and what we know we should have done. What we did and what we know we should have done. And all of us, this gap begins to emerge. And the only thing that we can stuff and fill in that gap is, well, regret. It's regret over the things that I did or didn't do and I wish I would have and I can't believe I didn't and oh, I should have done it this way and I wish I knew. And and in that gap, you feel just tons of regret. And what do we do with our regret? Well, that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna really talk through some things we can do. And the good news for you and for me is that the Bible isn't full of perfect people who got it right every time. The Bible is full of stories of people navigating real life as mortal human beings, just like you and me, and how they navigate and manage the regret that you and I all feel. Now, There's a lot of different ways you can handle your regret. I can think of four, and there's probably a lot more, but four off the top of my head that are very universal. These are all quick for us, they're very natural. We all drift into these, but they're ultimately pretty unproductive. And I think you know it, that's why we're not gonna spend very much time on it. Here's this, unproductive ways to handle regret is to avoid it, (laughs) just stuff it away, sweep it under the rug, pretend like it never happened. If I don't look at it, it won't be there anymore. I'm just gonna avoid it and put it in a place where I can lock it up and keep it away. The DSM-5, which has diagnostic criteria for cognitive disorders, uh, does bring up this factor of regret, and it's associated with one particular disorder where you have an absence of regret and zero remorse. It's antisocial antisocial personality disorder, which is what a lot of serial killers have. So if you avoid regret, you're probably a serial killer. That's what the moral of the story is. Next one is that you, uh, you wallow in it. You wallow in it, and wallow isn't a word we use enough, is it? You wallow in it, you sit in it. You get, now, uh, Mariners fans, they understand wallowing. They understand like sitting and grief and remorse and Come on, that's funny. I was looking forward to that one on my notes, but they sit in it, they know, and what's interesting about wallowing in something is that you feel stuck, but you aren't. That there are paths towards freedom that you're choosing not to take. And I get it. If you told me the story about the thing that you regret and the fallout and the impact of the decisions that you made, they are most likely significant. But I'm telling you, wallowing in it is not productive. It's not fruitful. There's better options out there. But if we do, if we sit in it too long, if we wallow too long in our regrets, oftentimes we start to internalize it. We start to internalize it. Regret is the feeling I have towards the decisions that I've made. Now, shame is the feeling that I have towards myself based on the decisions that I've made. And we start to skew our self-perception based on the decisions that we made. And so now it's just not that thing that I did, it's the person that I am. It's the I'll never change. I'll never be healthy again. I'll never get past it. We start to tell ourselves these things and I'm just, I'm warning you right now, God has better. What also could happen is we're all tempted to externalize it. Externalize it. It has nothing to do with me. It was, I was a product of my environment. It was more you than me. This is where we get defensive. This is where we become a victim. This is where we say, it wasn't my fault. I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, it wasn't the best choice, but you brought it out in me. And 
Come on, externalizing it. Those aren't the people that we wanna be around. Never mind the people that we wanna be. So we know that's not a productive choice. So what do we do? What do we do with regret? And what's so sticky and frustrating and disappointing about regret is that, well, it's in the past. In the past, you can't change. The past, listen to me, will always have the leverage. Your past will always have leverage because you can't go back and change it. Today, today, instead of leaving regret to permanently have leverage over our life, how do we start leveraging regret to move forward? If we can figure that out, I believe, well, I believe you could change your life. And today, the passage that I wanna go over to the rest of the time that we have together is in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is written by this ancient king of Israel. His name is David, a pretty prominent character within the Bible. And David writes this psalm. It's really a prayer or a conversation with God. He writes it down for us, which I'm so grateful for. And he, he writes down as he processes through one of the biggest regrets of his life. The thing he looks back on that was really a turning point of failure, a thing where he let his instincts and impulses take control and made some choices that train wrecked his life. In this particular story, David saw a woman and he let his instincts take over. This woman was already married to another person, but as the king of Israel, he took her as his own. Now, trying to spiral and figure out how to manage the decision that he had made, he took this, wife's, this, uh, this woman's husband and sent him to the front lines of battles to essentially be killed. This man is killed and David is now wrestling with the fact that he has this sense of unmet expectations and consequences that he can't seem to manage. And well, isn't that exactly the recipe for your regret too? The recipe usually comes in two forms. One, I get regret for when my actions don't align with my values. When my actions don't align with my values and I start to say things like, this isn't the person that I wanted to be. I never thought I would be in this place. This isn't who I want to be. When my actions don't align with my values, I get into trouble. And the second one is when you can no longer manage the consequences. Isn't that true? You and I, we're good at managing consequences. We're really good at it. Every day we have so many decisions that we make, big ones and little ones. And all along the way, we're trying to think to ourselves in the formula of, what are the consequences of the decision and can I manage them? And if I can, well, then who's it gonna hurt? If I can figure it out, if I can maneuver it, who's it gonna hurt? Regret kicks in large and in charge as soon as we get to a place where our actions create consequences that we can no longer manage. That's exactly where David found himself. And my guess is this is where you found yourself too. A silly example, I, I don't know about you, but I know that feeling that hypothetically, let's say I was going a few miles an hour over the speed limit, and I, and I think to myself, come on, I'm in control, the roads are empty, everything's fine, and you've had that feeling where you round the corner, and there sits the officer with the radar gun pointed right at your vehicle, and your heart drops, and you know, uh, I can no longer manage the consequences. I can slam on the brakes, but who's that gonna fool? The deed is already done. I can, I can explain it away. I can pretend there's an emergency, but let's be honest, it's gone outside of my control. And that's a silly example, but for you, it might be way more serious. It might be something like you never thought they would find out. And you thought to yourself, no one's ever gonna find out and it's not gonna hurt anybody but me. And then they did find out and it did hurt them. And you tried, and you tried to apologize, and you tried to do all the right things, but the work had been done, and the trust is lost, and now you can't manage the consequences anymore, and so you're stuck with this regret of, I wish I never would have. And that is where David finds himself in this prayer. And if you're like me, maybe we can learn something from it. The first thing that he does, this is so important, Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt. Two things he does here that I think are the most important things I'm gonna say today. Before we get to some catchy fill-ins, some interesting points, the first thing that he does that all of us need to do is he brings it to God. He brings it to a God of compassion and he brings it to a God of grace, a God he describes as a God of unfailing love. Listen, I don't, I don't know the way that you've come to describe God 
And if you're worried that your poor decision making is too much to bring to God, that he's gonna be somehow ashamed of you or embarrassed of you, that maybe you're too ashamed and embarrassed to bring it forward, let me just tell you, David had it right that he meets a God of unfailing love to do the thing that we all want to do, to blot it out, to wash it clean, to set me free, to remove the guilt that has become uh, such a burden for each of our lives. So first thing he does is he brings us to the table and then he gets practical. If you're taking notes along the way, you can start to fill some of these in. Here's what it is. Using your regret, not just to hold you back, but to leverage it for change, the first thing he does is recognize he's wrong. Recognize his wrongs. He's recognized you're wrong. And, and I, I was so tempted to just say recognize your mistake because it's like softer. I was really tempted to say recognize your sin, but then you guys get all defensive and fussy about it. So I'll bring up sin later, don't worry. But recognize you're wrong. Here's what he says. This is so good. This is so good. This is what David says. Purify, purify me from my sin. There it is. Dang it. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night, but at least I know what it is. At least I've named it. At least I've called it what it is. I think for so many of us, we just turn a blind eye. We do what I am most tempted to do, which is avoid it, to think it'll manage itself. It'll figure itself out. The time will heal all wounds. But I think what Jesus invites us to do in this beautiful way is to call it exactly what it is. Not just a mistake, not just an oops, but to say, God, through my actions that I'm not even proud of, I have ruined relationship between you and me, between me and others, or even between me and myself. And that breaks your heart. And the Bible would call that, well, sin. It would call it a failure, it would call it a mistake. And I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, if you are stuck in your regret because you have refused to call it anything in particular. And I'm not gonna make you raise your hand, I'm not gonna make you write it down and bring it up to me and I'll read it out loud. And we'll, I'm not gonna do any of that. But I'm gonna just invite you to have the courage to call it what it is, to call it what it was, to say that it was a failure, to say that it was a miss. And once you recognize it, well, then it starts to lose the power and authority because I don't know about you, I'm grateful for regret. I'm grateful that I have this tension inside of me that boils to the surface when there is a gap, when I don't aligned with my values and when there are consequences that are too big, I am so grateful that regret gives me the opportunity to learn. The other day, uh, I had come home from work and I was just in a, in a rut, I don't know. I usually have a pretty big leash of patience, a pretty optimistic guy, but I'm like anybody else. I have just bad days and I was having a frustrated day. Everything was setting me off, I was just irritable and I came home, I relieved our babysitter, my wife is at work and I'm with my kids and my kids were just full of enthusiasm. My kids were just being kids. They were all over me, they were climbing on one arm, pulling on the other, they wanted to play and they wanted my attention. I knew I had some stuff that I had to take care of, some things to do around the house, I had to make dinner, so I'm trying to make dinner Well, one likes pulling on my legs and one's pulling on my arm and it just all bubbles to the surface. I'm not proud of this but man, I just, teed off on my six-year-old. I just started yelling at her. I got in her face and I just got so frustrated. And I just like, man, uh, the Proverbs say that only a fool gives full vent to his anger and I was a fool. And I get full vent to my, my poor little six-year-old and, and I can see the tears start to well up in her eyes as she just froze. She didn't know what to do. She ran to her bedroom crying and I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I could say that right away, the first thing I felt was regret. I didn't. The first thing I felt was like, well, okay, that's justified. At least she's reminded that I'm in charge. At least she knows. And if she wouldn't have pushed me, because isn't it true, kids just, man, kids know how to do it, don't they? Golly, do they. And if, if she would have stopped, if she would have changed, if something would have been different, I mean, come on, come on, come on. I'm justified. And then that, the Holy Spirit just started nudging my heart. And he said, no, you act like a fool. That you mishandled your anger. The anger isn't the problem. It's mishandled anger that's the problem. And that you mismanaged it. And you violated relationship with your sweet daughter and a daughter of mine. And, and you need to make it right. And you, you, you misportrayed, let's just be honest, you misportrayed what a loving father looks like in her life and what a loving heavenly father would look like. And you need to own that. And I don't love that. 
I'm not proud of that. I don't wanna rehash it and wallow in it, but I owned it and I walked into her room and I knelt down next to her little face buried in the pillow. She didn't even wanna look at me and I said, hey, Winter, I'm really sorry. Daddy, daddy mishandled his anger. It has nothing to do with you and everything to do with me. And I'm really sorry and I know that probably hurt a lot. And that sucked to say. Oh man, it was gross. And, she felt, and part of me was still a little bit mad, part of me was a little bit angry, but man, I'm telling you, if you don't recognize it and call it for what it is, it will keep power over your life. But if you do, if you're bold enough, if you're courageous enough to call it what it is, it could start to lose power. And when it does, listen to me, when it does, you can start to do the second thing. You can ask for forgiveness. You can call it exactly what it is and ask for forgiveness. Because the other four ways of managing regret, we already talked about those, those aren't very productive. But you can't ask for forgiveness. And, uh, and usually in any message, I know in a room this size and with the amount of people that watch online, I recognize that not all of us are on board with Jesus yet. Not everyone's on board with Christianity. Maybe you got drug here for free snacks, which I'm so glad we baited you in. And uh, maybe you came here for free childcare and you just want your kids to have these values. And I'm so glad that you're here. Maybe you're skeptical, maybe you're curious, maybe you're optimistic. I don't know where you land on the scale, but I'm so glad you're here. And usually in every one of my messages, I try and throw the net so wide that even if you're not a follower of Jesus, that you can kind of do an all skate and we can all play along. Here's the hard part. This next part, I don't know how to make it an all skate. I don't, I don't know how to include everybody in this part. Here's what David says. Don't keep looking at my sins, which we'd all want that to happen. Remove the stain of my guilt. Removing the stain, removing it, well, I, I don't have a lot of options. If we call failure discernible, clear, that it is a yes or no question, it's, it's true or false, that if you're not a follower of Jesus, I don't know what you do with your regret. You can try and work it out in a karmic scale and you can do more good than you do bad, which I mean, it's noble. It's a good effort, I'm glad you're trying. But outside of that, you can avoid it. That's, not, that's pretty problematic. You can do a number of different things, but let me just tell you, you're an adult, you can believe whatever you want. But if you're open to it, can I propose what I believe God our Heavenly Father, capital G God, who created everything, you and me, what he brings to the table of what we should do with our regret. Can I just propose an alternative solution? You get to decide what you wanna do with it. But this is the hope that we have. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Come on, let's just put it this way. If you pretend that you've never done anything wrong, you're just intellectually dishonest. The truth isn't in you. You just, come on, even by your own standards, you just miss the mark. I mean, just call it what it is, but... If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That somehow, in some miraculous way, we serve a God, exactly as David said, of unfailing love, who will meet you with grace and forgiveness. Well, Lance, but I don't deserve it. Exactly, that's the point. That is forgiveness, that we have a hope. And if you're worried of like, okay, yeah, but if, if God knew, if God knew what would happen, he'd be, there'd be wrath and judgment and lightning bolts. I hate to ruin the surprise. God already knows. And if that's the path he wanted to take, you've been smote, you've been done. He would have already sent wrath. It would have already happened, but that's not the way that he chose. He chooses to be a God of grace and compassion with arms open wide. And if, if you're open to it, if you're open, if you're open to this idea that God can meet me and if I call it what it is, if God can meet me in the middle of it, well then maybe you have an option at number three is to renew your values. Renew your values, to bring a sense of renewal. And the good news is this one is an all skate. Everyone gets to play on this one. Everyone does get this idea and this opportunity to renew, maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time, maybe to recenter around what God has for our life, but to bring something back to the table. Here's what David it says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. God, would you just renew this loyal spirit within me? Would you bring back something that's maybe been lost? 
and would you refresh my sense of values? Because obviously I violated, I moved forward, and I'm calling it what it is, but now I need something new to do with it. And uh, the Bible uses a very serious and spiritual sounding word all the time throughout the Bible. It's called repentance. Repentance, very strong word. But at its core, it's simply identifying that the direction I'm going is, well, not the direction I wanna go, and turning to go, well, a new direction. To say that this direction that I was heading is no longer fruitful, it's no longer profitable, it doesn't align with where I wanna go, so I'll do what everyone does, I'll, I'll change direction. You do this all the time, you course correct, we do it naturally, but oftentimes we neglect doing it in our faith. And so I don't know what it looks like for you, maybe it's a full 180, one of you it's a one degree turn, but both of them are categorized as this changing of spirit, this open-minded humility to say, God, I don't have it all figured out and I would love some feedback. <laughs> Don't you want to work for a boss who loves feedback? Don't you want to be married to someone who loves feedback? Who's open-handed, not aggressive, who, who takes feedback well and says, yeah, of course, I want to do the best thing possible. If it's built inside of every one of us that we respect people who are receptive to feedback, why would we think that we serve a God who's any different? Who doesn't receive and love people who are humble enough to say, I don't have it all figured out says this, this is what David said in the Psalms. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit, or just one of humility, and you will not reject a broken, and there it is, repentant, a desiring of change, heart. For the last few years, uh, every fall, I've been leading uh, our marriage course, our marriage curriculum, uh, it's called Reengage, and uh, I get about 50 couples in a room, we sit, we sit them around tables, we do a little talk, we equip some tools, we just get a chance to Grow in your relationship and make some friends. That's really the goal of it all. And uh, what I love is when I come up to people in the lobby and I'm like, hey, you should, you should come to your re-engage this year. And they look at me so offended. Like, what do you think of my marriage? What are you trying to say? And I'm like, well, we've gotten your spouse's emails. And we're, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not trying to call you out. I'm not trying to say you're a disaster or a train wreck. I just thought you were open and humble enough to say, yeah, I don't have everything figured out because I don't either. I thought, I thought maybe you were in a place where you'd just say like, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to come. Because most of our couples, I mean, there's a few who are in really rough spots and I'm so glad they're there and they're trying to make a last ditch effort and turn around and if you're in there, great, come. But majority of our couples are just couples who are trying to figure it out. Who realize if we don't take the time to prioritize the most, relationship, most important relationship in our life, it'll just get too busy and it'll drift away and we'll lose track of it. And, so yeah, we'll take a few weeks and we'll prioritize it. And there's, maybe they're just in it for childcare, I don't know, but they're, they're in it and they say, you know, I'm humble enough to figure it out. And some walk away with a few new tools to make things better. Some walk away with a, some great reminders and new friends, I don't know. But I wonder if you're open and humble enough to just say, okay, yeah, God, I'm, I'm in. I wanna grow, I wanna learn, I wanna change. Because do you wanna answer the question of who you'll be 10 years from now with the same person? I hope none of my opinions change and I'm the same exact person. Oh, gross. I hope I'm smarter. I hope I'm better. I hope I'm a better husband, a better follower of Jesus. I hope I'm a better father. I hope I'm better as a friend. I hope I'm better in so many categories, but it's only if I have the humility to, well, repent and change. So join me, do re-engage, join a group. I don't know what it's gonna take, but get engaged. And if you do, this is where everything changes. This is where uh, we start to leverage regret instead of letting regret leverage us. Is at the end of the day, God can restore what's been lost. He can restore what's been lost. And this is the plead of David's heart. Knowing that something was gone, that regret and my shortcomings has robbed me of something that I'm so desperately looking for. And I don't know where you're looking, but maybe today you can start to look in the person of Jesus Christ. Because here's, here's what we see. Restore to me the joy <laughs> of your salvation, God, and make me willing to obey you. God, just restore in me the joy of your salvation. I found out recently that Starbucks right now has $1.77 billion in unredeemed gift cards. How great is that? Anyone else have a few one of these floating around in their drawer with anywhere between $3 and 40 cents on it? <laughs> And you're thinking, what good is that? What is good is that? What good is that? $1.77 billion in unredeemed gift cards. I wonder, followers of Jesus, 
where we have left our joy, our strength, our peace, and our hope simply unredeemed. That it's there, that it's accessible, but we just kind of left it on the table. We figured out, I'll get to it at another time. Could you imagine if $1.77 billion in pumpkin spice lattes were bought this week? <laughs> Run out, there'd be a shortage, it'd be an epidemic. Could you imagine if all the Christians in our community and in this church decided to once again reclaim the strength and the hope and the peace and the joy of their salvation? Could you imagine the effect that would have on mental health? Could you imagine the effect that would have on our church, on our marriages, on our families, on our jobs? <laughs> that is what's at stake, the joy of our salvation. And maybe you're here and that's new language for you. Maybe this is different. And, and you've said, you know what, enough's enough. I'm tired of trying to figure out what to do with my own regret, my own shortcomings. And if you would be so courageous as to call it what it is, to ask God for forgiveness, to desire a change in direction, then maybe, just maybe, God can renew in you what you've been looking for all along. A sense of peace, a sense of grace, a sense of hope that you didn't think was possible anymore. But maybe today, you could find. Would you do me a favor? As we close here, would you bow your head and close your eyes? Just a moment, we're gonna sing a song and we're gonna take communion together in the middle of it. But here's the opportunity I don't wanna miss. I don't wanna miss the opportunity to help some of you be confident and sure. Maybe sure that for the first time or the first time in a really long time, when we take communion together, you will be taking it as a follower of Jesus. Maybe for the first time, to simply humble your heart Say, God, I don't have it all figured out, but would you give me forgiveness? Would you show me a new direction? And God, would you restore in me what you designed to have in me? A sense of joy, strength, of peace in a life that's imperfect. God, would you do it? Heavenly Father, I pray right now for every person in this room I pray that they would know you personally. I, th I pray that they would know your peace and your joy. And Heavenly Father, for any person in this room that would be bold enough to say, I want you to draw near. They'd be bold enough to say, I want a personal relationship with you for the very first time today, that I'm changing my life. What is dead will be brought to life. And it's not because of my own strength, but it's only because Jesus gave his life on a cross that I may approach you and humbly ask for forgiveness. And exactly as David said, they will be met with a God of unfailing love. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that we would acknowledge what's wrong. We'd ask for your forgiveness. You'd begin to change our heart and you'd restore something new. God, I pray that in your holy name. Amen, amen. Would you stand with me? We're gonna to worship together. Let's stand. For the wrongs that you've redeemed
together and uh, we have this opportunity. And today I wanna take it with a lot of reverence, but also with joy. I wanna take this with joy today because when Jesus gave his life on a cross, he, he demonstrated this ultimate act of sacrifice. And when we take communion, what we do is we remember that. The bread symbolizes his body that was broken for us. And the blood, well, that we get juice. And it's a reminder of God's grace that washes us new. So today, would you take the bread, this little wafer, and with a heart that's grateful and full of joy, can we take it together? The same way, we're gonna take juice and we're gonna be reminded of God's grace. It sets us on a new beginning and a fresh start. May it restore the things that are lost. Let's take it together. And let's sing, come on, let's continue to worship. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so that you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do, and it's simple. Engage with people, create an environment where people are free to be themselves, and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat, and I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com.